Welcome and uh, to everybody who's here and welcome to our international audience. Uh, today is uh, the first day of spring, the vernal equinox. It's when the, the earth is actually pointing away from the sun at, a, at an angle and the sun is hitting the equator at 90 degrees. That's when you know it's the equinox. So that means it's halfway between summer and, and winter. And of course it's looking like spring here. For those of you who live in other countries, I don't know, but for those of us who, who live here in the south, the trees are blooming, it's very, very pretty, and it's still cold outside. I'm wearing a coat today, but it's gonna get warm pretty soon. So I'm looking forward to beautiful spring weather and a beautiful Passover. Let's ask God's blessing and we'll get started today. Father in heaven, we thank you for each one who's here. We ask your blessing, your anointing on the, on the, on the speakers and on the hearing today. Let us walk away with something that's a blessing to us today more than what we came with. Be with us today. We praise you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Without further ado. No, we're going to. Oh, okay. So we still got time to do that. Yes. I'm going to let you introduce it. Yeah, I told you. I told you. Well, I know if I'd known ahead of time I was going to be on camera today, I'd have put on makeup. Sorry, y'all. It's bad business. <laughs> um, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, I'm Janetta Everhart. I'm the treasurer of the church, but I'm also the registrar of the college, Ambassador Christian College, that which is owned by Christian Fellowship Ministries, which is our church. And we have an online campus, and we have an online student, online graduate with us today that um, is receiving his degree today. And so, I would like to present, do you want to come up or do you want me to bring it to you? Oh, you need to bring it to me. Oh, you don't yeah. want to come back, come walk across, you don't want to walk across yeah, the stage? Across the stage. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. You can walk I'll across. Here, across this will be the go. stage. <laughs> with all the lights and everything. I like it. <laughs> and we people from around the world can Do you see. want to hand it to him to shake his hand? Yeah, I might as well. Official. <laughs> this is our official graduation for today. So I'd like to present Francisco Ortiz, his Associate of Arts in Theology. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. All right, thank you. All right, let me uh, thank you very much. He's an online student. He's an online graduate. An online graduate now, I'm sorry. But you're coming back next year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's coming to campus. Yeah, great. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> good to have you folks here. Good to see you again. And let's uh, get started today. Today, the first message, in the, and we're having a split sermon today, the first message will be brought to us by the Dean of Students and Ambassador of Christian College, Dr. Stephen Souls. Thank you, Dr. Slough. Good morning to everyone uh, that's physically here, and uh, good morning to our international audience uh, sharing with us on Facebook today. We thank God for your presence today. We thank God that um, he's led you to our humble Bible study today. Um, I want to uh, talk to you today um, in, in preparation of Passover that Dr. Slough is going to get more into as we get closer uh, to that time. Um, but it, it, was, it was just laid on my heart to, to talk uh, today uh, to you about just the topic of examining yourself. Uh, examining yourself. And if you would, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We want to go to 1 Corinthians, and we want to go to chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians. And in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we want to look at verse, we want to start in verse number 27. Verse number 27. And that verse says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28 says, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So today we want to we 
begin to think about the process of examining ourselves um, and and what that what that means and and, and and how we can how we can do that and how we can better do that in in, in preparation uh, for the upcoming season. Um, verse twenty eight says, "So let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup." What you're examining has already happened, right? What what you're examining about your life has has already happened, and so. A, a good way of examining ourselves is to know that we have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, right? Right? We've all sinned and, and, and fallen short. Thus, we need to examine ourselves. And so in preparation of the season, uh, we start, to, we begin to do that. But how do we, how do, we do that? How, how, how do we examine ourselves? Um, and I believe I have the answer, and I, I believe I found that answer in Psalm 51. Uh, so, so turn with me to Psalm, Psalm 51. Amen. I believe I found some of those answers um, in, in, Psalm, in Psalm 51. One, one of the aspects uh, of Christian living is to learn you learn early is on the power of asking for forgiveness. To me, it would make sense to start there, right? You know, if we're going to examine ourselves, let's let's clear the slate and, and just ask for forgiveness. Um, and when we find David doing that, uh, we find David doing just that in here in Psalm 51. Um, the first verse, David is asking for mercy. Here in verse one, it says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. What's the best way God restores us? We've already, we, we, we're, we're asked for forgiveness, right? We've asked for mercy now. So, so, so what's another way? Um, he washes away our sins, right? We're, we're, we're washed symbolically through the, through the process of baptism, and we're covered by his blood, the blood that he shed on Calvary. And in verse 2 of Psalm 51, David says, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin." You know, if you've had children and they come back in the house from being from playing outside, you know, you got to wash them. You got to wash them. And we as the children of God, you know, we, we, we play on this world, right? We live on this world. We, we, we do what we do on this world. And we get dirty. We get dirty with the, with, 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 with the vows of sin and, and living everyday life. So we want to ask God to wash us. We, we, we want to ask for forgiveness and, 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 and beg his mercy, number one. And number two, we want to ask God to just wash, our, wash us from our sins and from, from our iniquities. Um, verse 3. Verse 3 here in Psalm 51 says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I, I acknowledge my transgressions. David acknowledges his transgressions. Right here in his verse. In, in, in other words, he's, he's, he's put his cards on the table. You know, he, he's, he's coming clean. He's saying, I've acknowledged everything that I've done wrong, everything I've done against you. I'm, I'm putting it here on the table. The ultimate transparency for yourself is self-examination. Because I can tell you what you did. You can tell me what I did. But you, only you know what you've done in totality. <laughs> only you know what you've done in totality. So, so that, so that, that being, so David, as he be, as he becomes more transparent with himself in in, in verse three, he's opening himself up. He, he's saying, "Hey, God, I've transgressed. I've transgressed, and and, and sin is, is is ever before me." And just like David acknowledged in this psalm, we too 
have to burden ourselves with that same process so we can begin to heal and be restored, number one. And number two, we can open up ourselves to receive God's knowledge, wisdom, and blessings. So by acknowledging what we've done wrong and acknowledging how we've fallen short, that's where the healing begins. That's where, that's where, that's where our, our, our walk gets closer and closer with God because we, we've opened ourselves up. We've opened ourselves up to be restored through him. Remember that, you know, in this process, we're examining ourselves uh, in, in preparation for, for Passover, um, in, in, in preparation uh, for the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus did for you and I. This is why we're acknowledging our sins, right? We're, we're through this process of examining ourselves, we're acknowledging our sins, not just out of habit, because it's, you know, it's, it's part of our, our favorite prayer, but because we want to partake of the body and the blood of Christ, because we want to take care, because we want to partake of the body and blood of Christ, we should know within ourselves we've practiced verse number one, verse number two, and verse number three of this psalm, right? These are these, these three verses that begin to prepare us for this examination process. And in, and in, in practicing these three verses, we begin to align ourselves with the biblical principles God has laid out for us. We begin to line ourselves up because when you, when you think about sin and you think about the Lord's Prayer, those are, those are, the, those are the core aspects, right? right? We ask for forgiveness of sin. We ask that God forgive us. And we ask that God, you know, he makes us whole. I want to jump down to verse 10 here in Psalm 51. And verse 10 says, Verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. So now the, the transformation is beginning. The, you know, the, the, the transformation, it, it begins now. Because now we're asking God, you know, for the, the, in the first three verses, we, you know, we've asked for mercy, we've asked to be washed, and we've acknowledged our sins. Now here in verse 10, we're asking, to, we're asking for God to create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. There can be no true change in you if it doesn't come from the heart. Most, but most vital organs in your body come in pairs, right? Your eyes, arms, lungs, legs. But you only have one heart. And from that heart, life flows. And your body is nurtured. When, when the blood returns from your extremities to your heart, it's, it's missing something, right? It's missing oxygen. It, it's, it's missing other nutrients, but, but which are also needed to live. It's the heart. After the blood has been returned to the heart, it is refueled, and that's what the and the heart pushes out that oxygen, right? When 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 you when you inhale and you exhale, your heart, you know, it, it brings the blood in and pushes it back out. It brings back in the unoxygenated unoxygenated blood and gives out the oxygenated blood. So it's through your heart. And that, and, that's, and, and, that, and that totally lines up with what, what David says here. When he says, creating me a clean heart. Because with that clean heart, that clean heart feeds your body, which makes your body clean, right? And in renewing the right spirit, you know, David here is asking for a renewed spirit. So that will restore his mind, you know? Because it, it, the mind and the body, they work together. They work together to make this thing work, right? To make our lives work. You know, we can't do nothing without a heart. Right, we can't do nothing without a beating, beating heart. Um, but it's these two aspects that that he asks for. He asks for a renewed spirit and a clean heart. You know, because we are examining ourselves, right? We're, we're preparing ourselves. Verse eleven. Verse eleven says, "Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy holy spirit from me. Keep me close. Keep me close to you, God. You know." Amen. Keep me close. Um, I don't want to be out of your presence. I want to stay strong in your presence. Verse 12 says, restore unto me the joy 
of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You know, sometimes we can get caught up in the day to day and we don't think about the joy that salvation brings. You know, yeah, we were saved years ago. We, we, we gave our lives to God years ago. But it was, but you remember that joy that you had? You remember that joy that you had when you when you when you gave your life over, when you gave your life to God, and He started to work in you. Restore to me that joy. That joy. Verse 13 says, Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So now we we're just we're, we're full. We're full. And we're now we're ready to go out and teach others so that they can feel the way that I'm feeling and that they feel the way that we're feeling because we've gone through Psalm 51 and, and, and we've done we've gone through these processes. Now we're ready to go out, right? Isn't that part of the Great Commission, to go out and to teach others? Um, here, here in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors thy ways. You know? Full restoration, full restoration. And I'm going to end here on verse 15 where it says, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. So to sum up this process that we've gone through here in Psalm 51, you know, we've asked God for mercy. You know, we've asked God for mercy. We've asked God to be washed in his blood. We, we've asked, we, you know, we've acknowledged our sins. We've acknowledged our transgressions. We've asked for a clean heart and a renewed spirit and to never leave our, and to never, for God to never, and for us to not to be a way out of God's presence. And then we sum it up. After, so after we have all that built in, now we're ready to open our mouths. Because nobody knows us until we open our mouths, right? Nobody knows what we're feeling or how we're dealing until we open our mouths. So at, so at the end of the day, after you truly examined yourself and you've gone through this process and you're ready to teach others, are you ready to open your mouth with that praise? Are you ready to open your mouth with that celebration? Yes. Okay. He says, I don't understand. We are washed through salvation. In Jesus we sin no more, says 1 John 3. So why regurgitate or why ask again for forgiveness? Why ask again for forgiveness? Yes. We should always ask for forgiveness because, we, because we're not, because we're, we're constantly in sin. I mean, one, you can't say, you can't, you you know, asking forgiveness one time does not absolve you of all sin. Going forward. Going forward. You're going to sin again. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's why it says we have to die daily. Amen. Amen. I mean, Amen. We ask for forgiveness for what we've already done. Already done. But whatever we do in the future, whatever that, that asking for forgiveness in the past doesn't cover what we are going to do. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and if you remember, that was one of the first thing I said. When we examine ourselves, we're examining what we've already done. Right. You know, because we because we've already asked for forgiveness for all of that, and now we're here. We're at this point, and at this point, you know, I'm I'm going through this examining process, um, but tomorrow I may stumble again, and and when I stumble again, I've got to ask God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I've I've got to. I mean that, that there's just no way around it, you know. And 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 and, and even Jesus says that with seventy times seven, mm -hmm. you know, we should forgive each other. You got a question? Uh, yes. Well, just a comment. I was going to say if you look at the example of Scripture all throughout the epistles of Paul and, and Peter, even in John, you know, constantly gave warnings to the church who were saved. You know, he was even writing letters. Paul was writing letters to the church. They were all saved, but he constantly gave them warnings about sin and remaining in right. sin. And it was a constant warning that he was warning these the, the churches, you know, right. uh, about about continuing in sin. Amen. So it wasn't just a one and done. Yeah, exactly. Thing, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yes, sir. 
I was just going to say, <clears throat> sometimes through life we go through trials and tribulations, and we end up quenching our spirit. Yes. Right. We, we right. push the spirit down because we think that we can do things when, without God. Right. So through life we push that spirit down, and just like eleven and twelve said, give me your spirit. Right. Renew. Renew my Renew. spirit. Yes. So we have to go to God, repent, and ask for the forgiveness of your sin. Yes. And start afresh again. Sometimes it's every second in the day. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it might just be every day. Right. Right. But we have to do like you just saying, examine right. ourselves, know when we sin, when we sin, ask for forgiveness right. or repent right then, run from that sin. Start afresh, just like right. what you're telling us in fifty. Amen. Right. Amen. Be aware of what our weaknesses are. Um, right. And and try and work on our weaknesses by examining ourselves, like Amen. I said, because everybody's got a weakness. Right. Where you know they're more apt to sin, like temper or jealousy or. Right. Everybody. Right. We've all got a vice. It, we've all yeah, exactly, <laughs> we've all and that's where examining yourself right. comes in. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Any other questions, comments? Uh, one final one. Yes, sir. Romans 3 says he forgives us for for the sins that are past. <laughs> You're not forgiven for tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Romans 3. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Forgives us for the sins that are past. So we have to remember to keep renewing ourselves, renewing each and every day. Um, but during this special time, we, we do want to... Uh, begin to examine ourselves um, and not um, and not and not and not take it lightly not take it lightly this is um there's one more question and yes i don't know if you want to take this one or if dr plow wants to take this one and um, my friend rod i think he's in maryland or pennsylvania he's asking do the animal sacrifices pay the price of the sin for the jews no um no, that's just symbolic, right? That's yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the sacrifices are just are, are symbolic. They don't pay for the sins, um, per se. Um, that's just a symbolic ritual. Um, that yeah, that's what that that's what that's for. Amen. Amen. Well, I will step aside. Doctor Slow will now come with his sermon. I thank you for your time. I thank you for listening, and be blessed, Doctor Slow. And be patient. Shift. Yep, we got to shift the camera here just a moment. Just give us one second. Can we do that one? Yeah, I don't know if we can use that one because it might be in front of the camera. Remember, we're going to shoot it to the side. Oh, yeah, good. <coughs> Sometimes I, now I'm getting a stack of electricity. Touch the van. I think that's just you keep having me. I just got, I'm just charged up. That's right, you just charged up. Uh, but I'm sitting down today. Is that level? Yes, that's level. That's level. I uh, hope you can see me with all these lights. If you can't, you're blind. So I hope you can see me, all right? Well, while we're getting set up here, I thought of another scripture in Hebrews 10, 4, where it says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Um, thanks for the help. All of you appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> it takes a church to get you set up. It takes a team. God didn't <laughs> require one man to do everything. It's one man or one woman. It's a team that God wants us to work. Uh, <clears throat> Good to see everybody here. Um, just a, a few things uh, in the way of the, uh, touching on a little bit of news today before I get into the message. You know, you heard over the summer about let's defund the police. So they did it up in uh, Portland. And after, in the last 12 months, year to date, there, have, there has been an increase in homicides, that's murders, by 2,000%. 2,000%. Now the mayor is begging for an increase of $2 million to refund the police. It backfired on him. Now, I'm no genius. 
I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm nobody. But when I heard them saying that, I thought, no, wait a minute. When a criminal hears they're going to defund the police, and he's a criminal, that's how, that's how he makes his living, maybe. Maybe he robs people. What would he be thinking if he hears they're going to defund the police? Common sense. So anyway, it backfires. So now they're going to have to refund the police after having defunded them. Now, go figure. Anyway, uh, at the border, the Red Cross is being rushed to the border now. 4,000 additional troops are being sent to handle a major surge and is considered a crisis. You know, President Trump said, we're not trying to keep immigrants out. We want immigrants in, but they need to come in legally. He said, let's get immigrants who have degrees and have uh, expertise who can come in here and build up our economy, who can build up our, our culture, who can contribute to America. So that's, uh, so it's not, uh, they called him a racist because he said, let's put a wall up. When all he's saying is, let's have legal immigration. Just make it legal. Uh, they just killed somebody yesterday, I think it was. He, he was illegal. He got now through the uh, border. He had, he, had been commit, he had committed 11 crimes. He had raped several minors, children. And the police caught up with him, and he pulled a gun on him. They shot him and killed him. So it's getting bad at the border. It's getting very bad. So pray that God will give our leaders wisdom to know how to handle this horrible crisis that's going on right now, which was created by the government. Crazy. Anyway, I want to get into the message today. We had some good comments there, and I appreciate it. Good to have all of our international audience watching today. I'm going to kind of dovetail into what Dr. Souls was talking about, about we need to examine ourselves because we want to look at the spiritual aspects of Passover. I've talked about some of the technical aspects, and well, we should, because the Bible says that, that the early church, <coughs> the early church, when they were keeping what we call communion, and that's a good term, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul uses that term. But when we're keeping communion, we're doing it according to Jesus as a part of the Passover. In Luke twenty two fifteen, I won't turn there. Jesus said, with desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. And so what he instituted was a part of the Passover. John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God. What is it that we eat when we take communion? We're eating his body, as it were, symbolically, consubstantially. We're drinking his blood, so we are ingesting the Lamb of God. Now, Do you sometimes have depression? Do you worry? Are you in fear? Are you in anger? Are you unhappy? Are you dissatisfied in your station in life? Do you have anxiety and you, and you lack peace? Do you lack peace in your life? You say, if I could just have this, do you ever get the if onlys? If only I could just have this, I'd be happy. If only I could just change this one thing, I'd be happy. If only I just didn't have this health problem, or if only I didn't have this financial problem or this debt. I won't turn to all these scriptures, but Ecclesiastes 10, 19, the wisest man who ever lived up to that time, he made this statement. Money answers all things. Have you ever heard anybody say, if I just won the lottery, pay off my mortgage, pay off my debts, pay off my credit cards, have a little money left over to take a vacation? What about some money left over to give to people who are in need? Money answers all things. Now, when Jesus said what he did, and I read this a couple of weeks ago. I won't turn to it, but it's Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, you're burdened in life. 11, what? 11 uh, ver verses 28 through uh, 30. In other words, if you are overburdened with with Anxiety, you are heavy laden. He's not just talking about people who pick up heavy boxes, but he's using that as an illustration of how we emotionally go through life. We're heavy laden. We we have all this on our on our shoulders. You've seen people who are sometimes stooped over like this because they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. You don't have to be that way. First First Peter five seven says, "Cast your care over on God." You got this big burden that's burdening you down. Cast that care over on God because he cares for you. You know, I've done this a number of times. I've had some anxieties, not many, but a few worries here or there. I'd go to bed at night, and that would be on my mind. I'd say, I'm going to sleep. I'd say, God, I've, I've prayed this. Lord, you're going to be up all night. I'm going to give this burden to you. You worry about it. I'm going to sleep. 
cast your worry over on God. He's going to be up all night. You don't have to be up all night. So if you're losing sleep over a depression, a worry, an anxiety, a problem that's in your life, you don't have to. What's this got to do with Passover? Well, just keep listening. If only I could just get over this one hump, then I'd be very happy. Well, Psalm 18, 1 says that Christ, or it doesn't say mention Christ there per se, but it says the Lord is my rock. God is a rock. And then Jesus in his parables talks about how a man built a foundation on a solid, built a house on a solid foundation, is built on bedrock. He says the winds came, the storms came, the winds blew, the rain descended on it, and that house stood because it's founded on a rock. Then there's another guy built a house, same kind of house, but he built it on sand. And Jesus gives us the exact same description. He says the, the winds blew, the storms came, the rains descended, and so on. He uses the same words, and that house fell because it wasn't built on a sure foundation. Our Christian life can just fall apart if we're not built on Jesus Christ. And he is our Passover. So Jesus said, if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, come to me. Peter said, now Peter knew Jesus personally. He said, now cast your burden over on him. Yeah. Cast your burden over on him. Several places Jesus, or God is called a rock. And Psalm 18, one is just one example. But in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul tells us the rock of Israel, the God who was with them in the wilderness, was Christ. When God the Father, Jesus said, I've come to reveal the Father. The God of Israel was the one we know as Christ. Now, there's several ways we can prove that. John 5, 37, Jesus said, no man's ever seen God. No one's ever seen God. Well, wait a minute now. Moses stood in the cliff of the rock, and God said, I will pass by you, and I'll put my hand over your eyes, Moses, when I walk in front of you, but then I'll remove my hand when I walk away from you. You can see my back parts, but you can't see my face. And Moses looked at him, he says, Wow, he's got a head and shoulders, a torso, he's got arms and legs, he looks like a man. What did Moses write in Genesis 1? We're made in his image. We look like God. Anatomically, we all look different. Male, female, we look different. But we look like God anatomically. You know, dogs have four legs and horses have a, you know, a long tail and everything. And elephants, they look weird. But we are made in the image of God. So no one's ever seen God. Well, then who was that that Moses saw? Jesus said, you've never heard his voice. And yet Adam told God in the Garden of Eden, I heard your voice. As you were walking in the garden, I heard your voice. Is that a Bible contradiction? No, they heard the voice of God the Son. The God of the Old Testament was the Jesus of the New. No one heard the voice of God the Father. Wait a minute now. Exodus 20, it says, They heard the voice of God speaking off of Mount Sinai. I am the Lord thy God who led you out of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Who's speaking? I wasn't Moses. If you read that carefully, Moses is down in the valley with the people. That wasn't Moses up there with the big old uh, bullhorn. Is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah, bullhorn. He wasn't up there doing it. Moses was down here with the people. And, and Paul said that Moses was shaking. Moses was trembling. He was hearing that voice. And I mean... He's scared, too. They're all scared. They're, they're scared out of their wits because this, the mountain, the smoke is coming off the mountain. There's a fire on top of the mountain. The ground is shaking. And this booming voice, louder than anything they've ever heard, louder than thunder, says, I am God. And Moses went, whoa. They knew that was God. But yet Jesus said no one's ever heard the voice of God. It wasn't God the Father. In the New Testament, we read about God and Christ. Even little kids talk about God and Jesus. We understand there's two of them. So in the New Testament, when it talks about God, it's talking about the Father. When it's talking about the Son, it just calls him by his name, Jesus. So the God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ. It's been said that Christ is the answer. It's true. Jesus has all the answers to whatever you're going through in life right now. And he is the answer. We need to see things from God's perspective, and this will help us out a tremendous amount. Everyone in this room has gone through problems, hardships, heartaches. We've all we've lost loved ones. Everybody in this room, somebody you knew, maybe as a parent, maybe as grandparents, aunts and uncles, we've lost them. Many of you have cried at a funeral because it hurt. All of us know what it is to have a broken heart. 
we've had problems. We've gone through heartaches and, and, and these struggles. But Jesus didn't say you won't have problems. He said, I'll be with you. He made this statement, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And years and years ago, over 30, almost 40 years ago, I saw a poem called Footprints. All of you have read that. Where the guy's looking at his life and he, you know, supposedly he's in the next life now and he sees a set of footprints. And there's two sets of footprints. And he asked the Lord, why are there two sets? And Jesus said, I was walking beside you the whole time. The whole time. And then he goes into the valleys of his life and he says, well, wait a minute. I only see one set of footprints. Why did you leave me when I was when I need you the most? And Jesus said, that's when I picked you up and carried you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. If we see things from God's perspective, we'll get through the hardships. I want to turn to some scriptures. You may want to go with me to some of these and read them in your own Bible. Psalm 41. Several scriptures in the book of Psalms I want to give you today. Psalm 41 now, there are five books that make up the book of Psalms. This is the last verse of book one. Chapter 41 and verse 13. Blessed be the eternal God of Israel. When you see the word Lord in capital letters, all capitals, it's the Hebrew name of God, the divine name, meaning the eternal. Blessed be the eternal God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. If we can just get a, 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 an understanding of what this means. Now, if I ask you where you're from, you'll tell me the town you grew up in. If I say, when are you from? Now, my grandpa, he, let me tell you when he was from. He was from the 1800s. All of you are from the 20th century. Now, if we have some people in here, you're not 21. Are You're over 21, aren't you? Yeah, so you're from the 20th century also. But this is the year 2021, so if we had somebody here who was only 20, they would be from the 21st century. Where is God from? Well, he's from heaven. When is he from? Everlasting. From everlasting. Now, I've laid awake at night since the time I was a kid trying to figure out how did God always exist and never have a beginning. If anybody created God, that person would be God. Whoever God is, he's the ultimate. The buck stops there. Can't go back any further. Because whoever would have created him would have to be God, and that person would have had to have been logically eternal without beginning. My mind doesn't understand that. Never had a beginning. A hundred trillion years ago and a hundred trillion eons ago, God existed. But I don't understand that. A hundred trillion is just the beginning of eternity. I mean, these are just words. Trillion, zillion. We don't know what that means. We can't grasp it. Do you know, 100 years is hard to grasp when you're only 20 years of age. They, some people did a survey. They went into nursing homes and asked these people who were over 100, what's 100 years like? What is it like to live? Yesterday. They said it's short. They said that. Now, if I said that, it doesn't mean anything because I'm not near that age. I'm very young. But uh, these people, a lot of them were over 100, and they said, 100 years? It's not that fast. I mean, it's not that, that, that long. It goes by fast. I want to talk about that. When you're 20 years old, you've got your whole life ahead of you. Your whole life. And from, from 10 to 20 is a long time because you've got to go through school, and that just seems to take forever. But from 20 to 30, when you hit 20, you're still, very, you're still a kid. You're still very young. But you enjoy your 20s, you're out having fun, you're kind of segueing from being a kid to being grown. But when you hit 30, man, you are mature. But here's the problem. You're enjoying being 30. It feels fantastic. And tomorrow you're 40. You say, wait a minute, what happened to my 30s? Where'd my 30s go? I, I wanted to stay 30. 32, 33, that's good, but I wanted to stay there. You don't stay there. You wake up one day, and now you're 40, you're middle-aged. You say, oh, wait a minute. I don't consider myself middle-aged yet. <laughs> so, okay, well, 40 is... My girlfriend that I had in college, uh, she called me on the phone years later. We were both out of college, but once in a while she called me. She said, I just turned 40. And she cried, not on the phone, but she told me she had cried and cried because she turned 40. And years later, when she turned 50, she didn't cry. She just she got over it finally. But you realize when you're 40, you're not a kid anymore. Well, I guess 40 is not so bad, and then tomorrow you're 50. What, wait a minute, what happened? 
Mr. Daniel doesn't take too long to get from 40 to 80, does it? I'm 81. You're 81. <laughs> that went by fast. The last 40 years went by a lot faster than the first, didn't it? I heard Billy Graham say years ago, he said, he said, the older you get, the faster it goes. And he said, at my age now, he said, time's flying by. Now, I heard him say that years and years ago. But if I were to ask Billy Graham today, do you remember saying that? That was a long time ago. He said, now it's recent. Now it's recent. I remember saying that one too long ago. I went, I've told you all this before, but I'll tell you again, not all of you heard this. I went to, to visit my school where I went to high school and went to uh, grade school. And uh, so I ran into my first grade teacher and another teacher that came up, we were talking, and I, and, and, and I said, do you remember me? She said, oh, yeah, I remember you. Now, at the time, I was 19 or 20. She remembered me. And I said, man, that was a long time ago, because I was six years old. And she said, no, it wasn't that long ago, maybe you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years. That wasn't very long ago. Think how fast 15 years goes by. 15 years is nothing. But when you're 20, that was a long time ago. It's a, see, our perspective needs to get changed. If you can see things from God's viewpoint, the horrible times you're going through now, you can go right through it. What I'm telling you today will help you get through the hardest times you're going through. A hundred years from now, nothing that you're worrying about today will matter. It won't matter. If you were to go out to the cemeteries and you look at all the people out there laying out there, a lot of those people knew each other. They were mad at each other. And they hate each other because somebody had done the other one wrong. They're both in the cemetery. It doesn't matter today. It just doesn't matter today. So God is from everlasting. Let's get God's perspective on things. In Psalm 90, now Moses wrote this. He was 80 when God began using him. <clears throat> in um, Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, before ever means before he made it, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. In Psalm 93 and verse 2, thy throne is established of old, you are from everlasting. God is from everlasting. Psalm 104. And verse 33, listen, what, what, you say, what's this got to do with Passover? We'll keep listening. Verse 33, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Now, David may have written this, I don't know, but whoever wrote it, he knew he was going to die. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Yeah. I'll sing praise to my God while I have my being. Then it's not like he's going to live too long. Look at verse 35. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. One day the wicked will simply cease to exist. Now look at verse 31. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. I will praise the Lord while, as long as I live, which is a very short time, but God shall endure forever. He lives and lives and lives. God inhabits eternity. In Psalm 106, across the page here, verse 48, a couple of pages over. Blessed be the eternal God. Now notice in Hebrew, his name is not Lord. That's the English mistranslation. In Hebrew, his name is the eternal. Blessed be the eternal God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Now, I want to turn over to Isaiah 57, and uh, it's verse 15, if you're turning with me, or you can just listen. I, Isaiah 57, verse 15. Before I read that, though, I want to give you another verse, which I won't turn to, but all of you know it because you've heard me quote it over and over and over. While you're turning to Isaiah 57, we read in the book of Micah, that the one born in Bethlehem, it says his goings forth are from everlasting. Not just God the Son. I mean, God the Father. We know he's eternal. But God the Son also, the one that says born in Bethlehem, is from everlasting. everlasting. So if God the Father has no beginning and has eternity in the past, so does God the Son. Now, Isaiah 57 
Verse 15 says, For thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. Now, eternity is infinite time, both ways, in both directions. God inhabits eternity past and eternity future. Not that the future has come yet, but, but 100 million years from now, God will still be inhabiting time. The beautiful thing is, if you come to Christ, so will you. You don't have eternity past, so far as we can tell, but you have eternity future. Now, while we're here in Isaiah 57, look at verse 21. There is no peace, says my God, to the wicked. Why is it that Christians who are not wicked have no peace at all, it seems like? They don't have peace. It's a question. Why, why is it that many times Christians don't have peace? Now, none of you in this room are wicked or you wouldn't be in church today. Let me ask you this. Are you half wicked? Nobody raised his hands on that one. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't have perfect peace in your life. Well, let me ask you this. What if you're not wicked at all? You're just evil. Could a person who is 100% evil, he's not wicked. Now, see, in the Hebrew, wicked is the worst. Then you have evil, a little better, and, and it, there's different, various degrees of, of sin in the Hebrew. Wickedness means absolutely twisted and abominable. All right, you're not wicked, but let's say you're 100% evil. Would you have peace in your life? No. Probably not. No. What if you're half evil? Probably not. Well, what if you're not evil at all, but you're just 100% bad? Probably you wouldn't have peace then either. You're bad to your parents, you're bad to your kids, you're bad to your neighbor. You're not evil, you're just bad. Well, what if you're not all bad, you're just half bad? You know, he's, a, he's not half bad. <laughs> Would you still have peace if you're half bad? Well, let me ask you this. Let's say that none of you in this room are bad. But now, don't raise your hands. This is rhetorical. But how many of you are 100% good? Oh, that's something to think about. That's why I don't want you to raise your hands. You've got to think about that for a little bit. Are you 100% good? Now, we just heard a, a, a good message here about you know, that sometimes we stumble and we have to repent. So probably nobody in here would raise his hand, I'm 100% good. Well, how many of you are half good? <laughs> what if you're 10% good? How do you have peace with God? Because if, I mean, how good do you have to be to have peace with God? There's no peace to the wicked, and we went through that whole series, probably no peace to those who are bad or evil or anything. But the thing is this, when you come to Christ and your heart is perfect with God, remember what God said about Job? He's perfect. Now, if all have sinned, how could he be perfect? His heart is perfect. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Is God's heart perfect? Yeah, God's heart's perfect. So if David is a man after God's own heart, now we know David in his flesh, he had his human foibles, but his heart is perfect. So the good news today is your heart can be perfect. Though you're going through your problems, you're going through valleys in your life, you're going through depressions, anxieties, and worries, but your heart can be perfect with God. You think about that. Even some of the kings of Israel, like Josiah, said he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So you and I can have peace in our life. We can. You say, yeah, but I can't have peace until I get rid of this. If only I could just get rid of that. If only, if only, if only. Look. There's a scripture that says, be content with what things you have. I don't know if I, yeah, I've got that written down. It's Hebrews 13, 5. Be content with what things you have. Just be content. You say, I can't be content until I have everything perfect. Then you won't get it perfect till you're 80 years old, probably. And then you won't have much life left to enjoy because you don't have near as much life at 80 as you do at 20. If you wait until you get everything perfect, you may be 90 before you get it perfect. Just be content. Which means if you're living in a one-room house with a dirt floor, be happy you got the roof over your head. Be happy for that. I'm not rich, but I'm, I'm not starving. You can look at me and tell I'm not starving. So I'm content. I wish I had this, I wish I had that, but I'm content. Now, that doesn't mean if you, can't bet, if you can better yourself, you don't try to better yourself, of course. You know, if you can get a better job, better car, better house, and you can afford it without going into debt, because that's bad. If you can afford these things, by all means, better yourself. But until you can, be content with where you are. Because otherwise you're going to be coveting. I want to go back to uh, Psalm 91 now. Psalm 91. 
people say, well, I've got this horrible problem, but in 100 years from now, it won't matter. Back in the 19, early 1970s, from 1972 to 1974, the biggest thing in the news was Watergate. And I mean, that's all you heard about was Watergate. Today, it's history. People don't talk about it now. What we have to have is a close relationship with Jesus. You've heard it said, because God is eternal. He inhabits eternity. The older we get, the faster time goes by. The older we get. How fast does a year go by for God? Yeah, it goes by so fast. Now, you've heard it said that a thousand years is like a day to God. Let's see. Let me see if I wrote that scripture down. It's actually in Psalm 90. Look at Psalm 90. Now, I'm going to correct you on something. You've heard it said that a thousand years is like a day with God. Well, Peter said that also, but listen to what Moses said. Moses wrote Psalm 90. A thousand years in thy sight, talking to God, are but as yesterday when it's past. Think about that. Now, the next 10 years, that's going to take a long time. But look at the last 10 years. It's gone. I woke up one day a few years ago to realize that it had been 30 years since Reagan had been inaugurated. I said, I can't believe that. It was 30 years ago that he was inaugurated? That seems so... 30 years seems like a long time, but I can remember Reagan being inaugurated like it was yesterday. You know, I have heard of... Um, you know, some of these science fiction stories, and you've seen some of these shows, where they freeze time. There was one uh, uh, out of limits program where somehow something had happened, and, and this man and his wife were caught in one second. And they can move around. And you've seen these shows where by standing, like statues like that. Uh, I've seen that in Outer Limits. I've seen it in the Time Tunnel programs. I've seen it in Star Trek where everybody's standing still. And what it is, the person's walking around in a second of time. How long is a second? Well, to me and you, it goes by pretty fast, but to them, you know, it just go on and on for days and days and days. Well, there was a, 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 a movie, a, a, a series on H.G. Um, Wells. It was fictional, but they were using him as a real person, but assuming he had had these episodes in his life, which he did, it's all fiction. But one episode is where somebody had invented a machine that would cause time basically to stand still, but yet they could move around and do what they wanted to do. So a lot, of, a lot of TV shows have done that. And so this one man, uh, he was a young man, they were at a college, and he was going to marry this girl, and this machine, somehow he couldn't get it to stop, and so he was caught in a second of time, and, and, and somehow H.G. Wells was able to slow himself down, and when he meets this guy, he's like 90 years old. How fast? I'm going to talk to you about how long a second is. Now right here I have a clock. And it's ticking. Seconds pretty, pretty quick. Now, in, in 10 seconds, I'm going to talk about that second. Ready? I'm going to talk about that second. It's already gone. That's quick. Before I could talk about it, it's gone. God says a thousand years are not like something that's going to take a long time. A thousand years are not like today. It's like it's already gone. To an eternal being, that's how fast time goes by. But God doesn't care because he's forever. Now, you and I are going to live to be so long, so man, we care about it. But God doesn't care how fast a thousand years goes by because he's got hundreds of thousands of years yet to live and then on. So try to get a perspective. If you see things from God's viewpoint, you're not going to worry too much about what's happening today. I watch the news, but I don't worry about it. I don't have to get it concerned about it because I know all this is going to be history one day. Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to set up his own kingdom. Now, what I want to share with you is, is that you don't have to worry because God loves you. Jesus said in John 6, no man can come to me, can. The Greek word means you're not empowered to come to him. You're not able to come to him unless the Father draws you. The fact that you were able to come to Christ is because God the Father looked down from heaven, and he loved you and called you. To Christ called you to salvation. Not everybody at this time is being called. First Corinthians 1 26, Paul said, You see your calling, brethren, how that not many mighty and noble were called. So there are a lot of people that are not called. 
When you get down in the dumps or when you get depressed or when you get anxious and when you get frustrated and worried, just remember God has a calling on your life and he hasn't called everybody. But not only has he called you to salvation, he's called you to a much greater reward in his kingdom. Why would he pick you or me? I don't know. But the way you have a great reward, remember the two things you have to do, keep God's law and teach men so. The average church member out there, they don't know that. They think, well, I'm saved by grace, end of the story. When I die, I'll go to heaven and sit down in a, in a mansion, and I'll retire forever. That's not the reward. The reward is to be a, a to have a, a place, a position in God's kingdom, in the Father's house, which is God's kingdom. And in his Father's house, there are many, the, the King James's mansions. Even the New King James changes that because that's a mistranslation. It means many offices, many stations, many opportunities. So God has called you to salvation because he loves you. But there are millions or billions of people that have not heard the gospel, and he hasn't called them yet. He's called you. Secondly, he's called you to a great reward. Now, you're going through trials. You're going through tribulations. You're going through hardships. You're going through problems right now. I didn't ask you. I just feel like everybody probably here has got something going on. Put it in God's perspective. Uh, 10,000 years from now, what you're going through now, you probably won't remember it. And if you did, you wouldn't talk about it. Do you remember when you were a kid playing in the sandbox? Yeah, you used to, I can remember that. Do you remember when that kid stole your, 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 took away your toy and you cried your heart out? Are you still mad at it? You're not mad at it now. A long time ago. And see, one day you're going to look back at the problems you've got now and you're going to realize how long ago that was. It's, yeah. It just doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. And finally, in conclusion, Psalm 103. Wait a minute. No, i got to go to one more. In, in Psalm 91, let me take a look at that first. Psalm 91, while we're here, verse 14. Listen to what your Heavenly Father says. Because he, that's you, has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Yeah. You can keep all the feast days and do it all right and count Pentecost and get on the right day and do all these technical things but if you don't love God you're missing it you, the, the relationship between you and God is a relationship of love if you set your love on God he promises to deliver you folks the tribulation is coming up soon because they got the temple now ready to build I will set him on high because he's known my name he shall call upon me and I will answer him do you want answered prayer love God I will be with him in times of trouble. Now, it doesn't say you won't have trouble, but I'll be with you when you're in trouble. I will deliver him, and not only that, but I'll honor him. Remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was not delivered from the furnace. They were delivered in the furnace. And, and Nebuchadnezzar said, I see a fourth man there. <laughs> Jesus will be with you in this time of trouble. And it says, I will deliver him and I'll honor him. When they came out of that furnace, they got honored in positions of authority. If you will serve God and love him, you might say, buddy around with God. Talk to God all day long when you're in the car at different times. Sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and just say, God, I love you. I just want to tell you, I love you. Lord Jesus, I love you. And I've told the Lord many times, I'm proud of him. Now, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I am. I'm very proud of Jesus for what he went through. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Why don't you claim that? Claim to live a long life. And then finally in Psalm 103, one of the most beautiful chapters in all the Psalms. Verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He won't always chide. He's not going to scold you all the time. Neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins the way we deserve. He's been lenient with us, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, and that's pretty high, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Now, if you're wicked, you may be in trouble, but if you fear God and you're doing your best, he's got mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pities his children. You know, a loving father says, that poor kid, well, he's only six years old, and you have mercy. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers. He hadn't forgotten that we're just dust. That's all. We're just dust. 
For as man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes. You see this beautiful morning glory or this beautiful flower. But the next day, it's gone. For the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. That flower, beautiful, beautiful flower, and it just has such a short time. I've been told, I don't have it documented, but I've been told that butterflies last only about three days. Have a very short lifetime. They last longer as a worm. But then when they finally do become a beautiful butterfly, they don't live very long. And then they're gone forever. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. So for all eternity, you can expect God's mercy. Upon them that fear him and his righteousness and the children's children, to such as keep his covenant. Now, none of you are probably perfect, but are you keeping his covenant the best you can? To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Don't forget his commandments and you can expect the mercy of God. You can expect him to deliver you. You can expect him to be there for you during the trials and the troubles that we all go through. Do we have any questions? Um, do we have any questions here? Just a couple comments. J.R. made a comment that said many people get saved but they don't know why or what the purpose of their salvation is. And then he says the yeah. kingdom of God. Yeah, our purpose to be saved is to be in the kingdom of God. To amen. join the family of God for eternity. Amen. amen. Yeah, amen. That's the will of God there. Yeah. Okay. Be a son or a daughter. What we're going through now is just you know, nothing compared to eternity. What did she say? Um, Patty says, um, I pray a prayer of thanks every day because he found me special enough to call me now. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. Yeah. yeah for those of you who didn't hear that, uh, she said that God, uh, you know, called you now. And she felt. She's thankful that God called her now. She's very thankful that God called her now. Could have waited till the millennium. But you get a bigger reward if you're called now. Any other comments? What was that? What's that verse in Exodus 14? Is it Exodus 14, 7 or 7, 14? For, about what? About holding your peace and God will fight your battles. Oh, that's when they get, that's probably chapter 14 where they're getting ready to go across the Red Sea and they're all crying out to Moses and, and, and Moses is the one who said that. He said, hold your peace, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then God says, it's on the right page. 14, 14. 14, 14. And then God says, why do you stand crying out to me? Tell the people to go forward. And Moses looks and there's this big body of water. There's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. But in faith, they start walking and the Red Sea opens up. Yeah, it says the Lord will fight for you and you hold your peace. Yeah, that's what Moses said. The Lord will fight for you. You hold your peace. That's what we need to do. Going through trial. Yeah, talk to God. Pray to God. Cry out to God. But then once you've done that, you commit it to God. Then hold your peace and expect him to take care of it. Good comments. Any other comments, thoughts, questions? What's this got to do with Passover? Let me say this and I'll shut up. The one who died for you was the creator of the universe who gave everything he had for you and risked his eternity to come here and to show you how to live and to die in your place so you don't have to, the second death. That's the kind of love God has for us. So the problems we're going through, God is very much aware of what we're going through. And he loves you. You hang on to him, and he won't let go of you. Amen. Any final thoughts or questions? Well, God bless you all. Thank you for coming out today. And uh, congratulations, uh, Francisco. Uh, several people have said they were blessed to be here. Thank you. It was a wonderful service. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Steve's uh, message dug right into mine. Yes, sir. I just had a question. Um, did you say that he risked? Uh, eternity? He risked eternity. On that bit. He did risk his eternity because if he had sinned one time, no one died for him. No one paid his penalty. He would have had to have paid his own penalty. Yeah. All right. Well, be blessed. Have a great week. Uh, we're dismissed. Hope to see all of you back here next week. <laughs>